Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we return to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Our heroes are still trapped aboard the Nautilus, but we are starting to learn more about the mysterious Captain Nemo, and more adventures await. It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part 8 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Chapter 4. The Red Sea In the course of the day of the 29th of January, the island of Ceylon disappeared under the horizon, and the Nautilus, at a speed of 20 miles an hour, slid into the labyrinth of canals, which separate the Maldives from the Lacadives. We had made 16,220 miles, or 7,500 French leagues, from our starting point in the Japanese seas. The next day, 30th of January, when the Nautilus went to the surface of the ocean, there was no land in sight. Its course was north-northeast, in the direction of the Sea of Oman, between Arabia and the Indian Peninsula, which serves as an outlet to the Persian Gulf. It was evidently a block without any possible egress. Where was Captain Nemo taking us to? I could not say. This, however, did not satisfy the Canadian, who that day came to me asking where we were going. We are going where our captain's fancy takes us, Master Ned. His fancy cannot take us far, then, said the Canadian. The Persian Gulf has no outlet, and if we do go in, it will not be long before we are out again. Very well, then. We will come out again, Master Land, and if, after the Persian Gulf, the Nautilus would like to visit the Red Sea, the Straits of Bab el Mandeb are there to give us an entrance. I need not tell you, sir, said Ned Land, that the Red Sea is as much closed as the Gulf, as the Isthmus of Suez is not yet cut, and if it was, a boat as mysterious as ours would not risk itself in a canal cut with sluices, and again, the Red Sea is not the road to take us back to Europe. But I never said we were going back to Europe. What do you suppose, then? I suppose that, after visiting the curious coasts of Arabia and Egypt, the Nautilus will go down the Indian Ocean again, perhaps cross the Channel of Mozambique, perhaps off the Mascarenus, so as to gain the Cape of Good Hope. And once at the Cape of Good Hope? asked the Canadian with peculiar emphasis. Well, we shall penetrate into that Atlantic where we do not yet know. Our friend Ned, you are getting tired of this journey under the sea. You are surfeited with the incessantly varying spectacle of submarine wonders. For my part, I shall be sorry to see the end of a voyage which is given to so few men to make. For four days, till the 3rd of February, the Nautilus scoured the Sea of Oman, at various speeds and at various depths. It seemed to go at random, as if hesitating as to which road it should follow, but we never passed the Tropic of Cancer. In quitting this sea, we sighted Muscat for an instant, one of the most important towns of the country of Oman. I admired its strange aspect, surrounded by black rocks upon which its white houses and forts stood in relief. I saw the rounded domes of its mosques, the elegant points of its minarets, its fresh and verdant terraces. But it was only a vision. The Nautilus soon sank under the waves of that part of the sea. We passed along the Arabian coast for a distance of six miles, its undulating line of mountains being occasionally relieved by some ancient ruin. The 5th of February, we at last entered the Gulf of Aden, a perfect funnel introduced into the neck of Bab el Mandeb, through which the Indian waters entered the Red Sea. The 6th of February, the Nautilus floated in sight of Aden, perched upon a promontory which a narrow isthmus joins to the mainland, a kind of inaccessible Gibraltar, the fortifications of which were rebuilt by the English after taking possession in 1839. I caught a glimpse of the octagon minarets of this town, which was at one time the richest commercial magazine on the coast. I certainly thought that Captain Nemo, arrived at this point, would back out again. But I was mistaken, for he did no such thing, much to my surprise. The next day, on the 7th of February, we entered the Straits of Bab el Mandeb, the name of which in the Arab tongue means the Gate of Tears. To twenty miles in breadth, that is only thirty-two in length, and for the Nautilus starting at full speed, the crossing was scarcely the work of an hour. 
but I saw nothing, not even the island of Perim, with which the British government has fortified the position of Aden. There were too many English or French steamers of the line of Suez to Bombay, Calcutta to Melbourne, or from Bourbon to the Mauritius, furrowing this narrow passage for the Nautilus to venture to show itself, so it remained prudently below. At last, about noon, we were in the waters of the Red Sea. I would not even seek to understand the caprice which had decided Captain Nemo upon entering the Gulf, but I quite approved of the Nautilus entering it. Its speed was lessened, sometimes it kept on the surface, sometimes it dived to avoid a vessel, and thus I was able to observe the upper and lower parts of this curious sea. The 8th of February, from the first dawn of day, Mocha came in sight, now a ruined town whose walls would fall at a gunshot, yet which shelters here and there some verdant date trees, once an important city containing six public markets and twenty-six mosques, and whose walls, defended by fourteen forts, formed a girdle of two miles in circumference. The Nautilus then approached the African shore, where the depth of the sea was greater. There, between two waters, clear as crystal, through the open panels, we were allowed to contemplate the beautiful bushes of brilliant coral and large blocks of rock, clothed with a splendid fur of green along these sandbanks and algae and fuci. What an indescribable spectacle, and what variety of sights and landscapes along these sandbanks and volcanic islands which bound the Libyan coast. But where these shrubs appeared in all their beauty was on the eastern coast, which the Nautilus soon gained. It was on the coast of Tehama, for there not only did this display of zoophytes flourish beneath the level of the sea, but they also formed picturesque interlacings which unfolded themselves about sixty feet above the surface, more capricious but less highly coloured than those whose freshness was kept up by the vital power of the waters. What charming hours I passed thus at the window of the saloon! What new specimens of submarine flora and fauna did I admire under the brightness of our electric lantern! The 9th of February, the Nautilus floated in the broadest part of the Red Sea, which is comprised between Suakin in the west coast and Confidar on the east coast, with a diameter of 90 miles. That day at noon, after the bearings were taken, Captain Nemo mounted the platform where I happened to be, and I was determined not to let him go down again without at least pressing him regarding his ulterior projects. As soon as he saw me, he approached and graciously offered me a cigar. Well, sir, does this Red Sea please you? Have you sufficiently observed the wonders it covers, its fishes, its zoophytes, its sponges and its forests of coral? Did you catch a glimpse of the towns on its borders? Yes, Captain Nemo, I replied, and the Nautilus is wonderfully fitted for such a study. Ah, uh, it is an intelligent boat. Yes, sir, intelligent and invulnerable. It fears neither the terrible tempests of the Red Sea, nor its currents, nor its sandbanks. Certainly, said I, this sea is quoted as one of the worst, and in the time of the ancients, if I am not mistaken, its reputation was detestable. Detestable, Monsieur Aronnax. The Greek and Latin historians do not speak favourably of it, and Strabo says it is very dangerous during the Atesian winds and in the rainy season. The Arabian Edrisi portrays it under the name of the Gulf of Colzum, and relates that vessels perished there in great numbers on the sandbanks, and that no one would risk sailing in the night. It is, he pretends, a sea subject to fearful hurricanes, strewn with inhospitable islands, and which offers nothing good, either on its surface or in its depths. One may see, I replied, that these historians never sailed on board the Nautilus. Just so replied the captain, smiling, and in that respect moderns are not much more advanced than the ancients. It required many ages to find out the mechanical power of steam. Who knows if, in another hundred years, we may not see a second Nautilus. Progress is slow, Monsieur Aronnax. It is true, I answered. Your boat is at least a century before its time, perhaps an era. What a misfortune that the secret of such an invention should die with its inventor. Captain Nemo did not reply. After some minutes' silence, he continued. You were speaking of the opinions of ancient historians upon the dangerous navigation of the Red Sea. It is true, said I, but were not their fears exaggerated? Yes and no, Monsieur Aronnax, replied Captain Nemo, who seemed to know the Red Sea by heart. 
That which is no longer dangerous for a modern vessel, well-rigged, strongly built and master of its own course, thanks to obedient steam, offered all sorts of perils to the ships of the ancients. Picture to yourself those first navigators venturing in ships made of planks sewn with the cord of the palm tree, saturated with the grease of the sea dog and covered with powdered resin. They had not even instruments wherewith to take their bearings, and they went by guess among currents of which they scarcely knew anything. Under such conditions, shipwrecks were, and must have been, numerous. But in our time, steamers run between Suez and the South Seas have nothing more to fear from the fury of this gulf, in spite of contrary trade winds. The captain and passengers do not prepare for their departure by offering propitiatory sacrifices, and on their return they no longer go ornamented with wreaths and gilt fillets to thank the gods in their neighbouring temple. I agree with you, said I, and steam seems to have killed all gratitude in the heart of sailors. But, Captain, since you seem to have especially studied this sea, can you tell me the origin of its name? There exist several explanations on the subject, Monsieur Aranax, would you like to know the opinion of a chronicler of the 14th century? Willingly. This fanciful writer pretends that its name was given to it after the passage of the Israelites, when Pharaoh perished in the waves which closed at the voice of Moses. A poet's explanation, Captain Nemo, I replied, but I cannot content myself with that. I ask you for your personal opinion. Here it is, Monsieur Aranax. According to my idea, we must see in this appellation of the Red Sea a translation of the Hebrew word Edom, and if the ancients gave it that name, it was on account of the particular colour of its waters. But up to this time I have seen nothing but transparent waves and without any particular colour. Very likely. But as we advance to the bottom of the gulf, you will see this singular appearance. I remember seeing the Bay of Tor entirely red, like a sea of blood. And you attribute this colour to the presence of a microscopic seaweed? Yes. So, Captain Nemo, it is not the first time you have overrun the Red Sea on board the Nautilus. No, sir. As you spoke a while ago of the passage of the Israelites and the catastrophe of the Egyptians, I will ask you whether you have met with the traces under the water of this great historical fact. No, sir, and for a good reason. What is it? It is that the spot where Moses and his people passed is now so blocked up with sand that the camels can barely bathe their legs there. You can well understand that there would not be water enough for my Nautilus. And the spot? The spot is situated a little above the Isthmus of Suez, in the arm that formerly made a deep estuary, when the Red Sea extended to the Salt Lakes. Now, whether this passage were miraculous or not... The Israelites, nevertheless, crossed there to reach the Promised Land, and Pharaoh's army perished precisely on that spot, and I think that excavations made in the middle of the sand would bring to light a large number of arms and instruments of Egyptian origin. That is evident, I replied, and for the sake of archaeologists, let us hope that these excavations will be made sooner or later, when new towns are established on the Isthmus, after the construction of the Suez Canal. A canal, however... Very useless to a vessel like the Nautilus. Very likely, but useful to the whole world, said Captain Nemo. The ancients well understood the utility of a communication between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean for their commercial affairs, but they did not think of digging a canal direct, and took the Nile as an intermediate. Very probably, the canal which united the Nile to the Red Sea was begun by Sistrosis, if we may believe tradition, one thing is certain, that in the year 615 before Jesus Christ, Nikos understood the works of an alimentary canal to the waters of the Nile across the plain of Egypt, looking towards Arabia. It took four days to go up this canal, and it was so wide that two triremes could go abreast. It was carried on by Darius and probably finished by Ptolemy II. Strabo saw it navigated, but its decline from the point of departure near Bubastis to the Red Sea, was so slight that it was only navigable for a few months in the year. This canal answered all commercial purposes to the age of Antonius, when it was abandoned and blocked up with sand. Restored by order of the Caliph Omar, it was definitely destroyed in 761 or 762 by Caliph al-Mansur, 
who wished to prevent the arrival of provisions to Mohammed ben Abdullah, who had revolted against him. During the expedition into Egypt, your General Bonaparte discovered traces of the works in the desert of Sudan, and, surprised by the tide, he nearly perished at the very place where Moses had encamped three thousand years before him. Well, Captain, what the ancients dared not undertake, this junction between the two seas, which will shorten the road from Cadiz to India, Monsieur Lesseps has succeeded in doing, and before long he will have changed Africa into an immense island. Yes, Monsieur Aronnax, you have the right to be proud of your countrymen. Such a man brings more honour to a nation than great captains. He began, like so many others, with disgust and rebuffs, but he has triumphed, for he has the genius of will, and it is sad to think that a work like that, which ought to have been an international work, and which would have sufficed to make a reign illustrious, should have succeeded by the energy of one man. All honour to Monsieur Lesseps. Yes, honour to the great citizen, I replied, surprised by the manner in which Captain Nemo had just spoken. Unfortunately, he continued, I cannot take you through the Suez Canal, but you will be able to see the long jetty of Port Said after tomorrow, when we shall be in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean? I exclaimed. Yes, sir. Does that astonish you? What astonishes me is to think that we shall be there the day after tomorrow. Indeed. Yes, Captain, although by this time I ought to have accustomed myself to be surprised at nothing since I have been on board your boat. But the cause of this surprise? Well, it is the fearful speed you will have to put on the Nautilus if the day after tomorrow she is to be in the Mediterranean, having made the round of Africa and doubled the Cape of Good Hope. Who told you that we would make the round of Africa and double the Cape of Good Hope, sir? Well, unless the Nautilus sails on dry land and passes above the isthmus, or beneath it, Monsieur Aronnax. Beneath it? Certainly, replied Captain Nemo quietly. A long time ago, nature made under this tongue of land what man has this day made on its surface. What? Such a passage exists? Yes, a subterranean passage, which I have named the Arabian Tunnel. It takes us beneath Suez and opens into the Gulf of Pelusium. But this isthmus is composed of nothing but quicksands, to a certain depth. But at fifty-five yards there is a solid layer of rock. Did you discover this passage by chance? I asked, more and more surprised. Chance and reasoning, sir, and by reasoning even more than by chance. Not only does this passage exist, but I have profited by it several times. Without that I should not have ventured this day into the impassable Red Sea. I noticed that in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean there existed a certain number of fishes of a kind perfectly identical. Certain of the fact, I asked myself, was it possible that there was no communication between the two seas? If there was, the subterranean current must necessarily run from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, from the sole cause of the difference of level. I caught a large number of fishes in the neighbourhood of Suez, I passed a copper ring through their tails and threw them back into the sea. Some months later, on the coast of Syria, I caught some of my fish ornamenting with the ring. Thus, the communication between the two was proved. I then sought for it with my nautilus. I discovered it, ventured into it, and before long, sir, you too will have passed through my Arabian tunnel. Chapter 5. The Arabian Tunnel that same evening, the Nautilus floated on the surface of the sea, approaching the Arabian coast. I saw Jeddah, the most important counting-house of Egypt, Syria, Turkey and India. I distinguished clearly enough its buildings, the vessels anchored at the quays, and those whose draught of water obliged them to anchor in the roads. The sun, rather low on the horizon, struck full on the houses of the town, bringing out their whiteness. Outside, some wooden cabins, and some made of reeds, showed the quarter inhabited by the Bedouins. Soon, Jeddah was shut out from view by the shadow of night, and the Nautilus found herself under water slightly phosphorescent. The next day, the 10th of February, we sighted several ships running to windward. The Nautilus returned to its submarine navigation, but at noon, when her bearings were taken, the sea being deserted, she rose again to her waterline. Accompanied by Ned and Conseil, I seated myself on the platform. 
The coast on the eastern side looked like a mass faintly printed upon a damp fog. We were leaning on the sides of the pinace, thinking of one thing and another, when Ned Land, stretching out his hand towards a spot on the sea, said, "'Do you see anything there, sir?' "'No, Ned,' I replied, "'but I have not your eyes, you know.' "'Look well,' said Ned, "'there, on the starboard beam, about the height of the lantern. "'Do you not see a mass which seems to move?' "'Certainly,' said I, after close attention. "'I see something like a long black body on the top of the water.' Certainly before long, the black object was not more than a mile from us. It looked like a great sandbank deposited in the open sea. It was a gigantic dugong. Ned Land looked eagerly. His eyes shone with covetousness at the sight of the animal. His hand seemed ready to harpoon it. One would have thought he was waiting the moment to throw himself into the sea and attack it in its element. At this instant, Captain Nemo appeared on the platform. He saw the dugong, understood the Canadian's attitude and addressing him said, "'If you held a harpoon just now, Master Land, would it not burn in your hand?' "'Just so, sir. And you would not be sorry to go back for one day to your trade of a fisherman, and to add this cetacean to the list of those you have already killed?' "'I should not, sir. Well, you can try.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Ned Land, his eyes flaming. "'Only continued the captain, I advise you for your own sake not to miss the creature. Is the dugong dangerous to attack? I asked, in spite of the Canadian's shrug of the shoulders. Yes, replied the captain. Sometimes the animal turns upon its assailants and overturns their boat. But for Master Land, this danger is not to be feared. His eye is prompt, his arm sure. At this moment, seven men of the crew, mute and immovable as ever, mounted the platform. One carried a harpoon and a line similar to those employed in catching whales. The pinace was lifted from the bridge, pulled from its socket, and let down into the sea. Six oarsmen took their seats, and the coxswain went to the tiller. Ned, Conseil, and I went to the back of the boat. "'You are not coming, Captain?' I asked. "'No, sir, but I wish you good sport.' The boat put off, and, lifted by the six rowers, drew rapidly towards the dugong, which floated about two miles from the Nautilus. Arrived some cable's length from the cetacean, the speed slackened and the oars dipped noiselessly into the quiet waters. Ned Land, harpoon in hand, stood in the forepart of the boat. The harpoon used for striking the whale is generally attached to a very long cord which runs out rapidly as the wounded creature draws it after him, but here the cord was not more than ten fathoms long, and the extremity was attached to a small barrel which, by floating, was to show the course the dugong took under the water. I stood and carefully watched the Canadian's adversary. This dugong, which also bears the name of the Halicor, closely resembles the manatee, its oblong body terminated in a lengthened tail and its lateral fins in perfect fingers. Its difference from the manatee consisted in its upper jaw, which was armed with two long and pointed teeth which formed on each side diverging tusks. This dugong, which Ned Land was preparing to attack, was of colossal dimensions. It was more than seven yards long. It did not move, and seemed to be sleeping on the waves, which circumstance made it easier to capture. The boat approached within six yards of the animal. The oars rested on the rowlocks. I half rose. Ned Land, his body thrown a little back, brandished the harpoon with his experienced hand. Suddenly, a hissing noise was heard, and the dugong disappeared. The harpoon, although thrown with great force, had apparently only struck the water. "'Curse it!' exclaimed the Canadian furiously. "'I have missed it!' "'No,' said I. "'The creature is wounded. Look at the blood, but your weapon has not stuck in his body.' "'My harpoon! My harpoon!' cried Ned Land. The sailors rowed on, and the coxswain made for the floating barrel. The harpoon regained. We followed in pursuit of the animal.' The latter came now and then to the surface to breathe. Its wound had not weakened it, for it shot onwards with great rapidity. The boat, rowed by strong arms, flew on its track. Several times it approached within some few yards, and the Canadian was ready to strike, but the dugong made off with a sudden plunge, and it was impossible to reach it. Imagine the passion which excited impatient Ned Land. He hurled at the unfortunate creature the most energetic expletives in the English tongue. For my part... I was only vexed to see the dugong escape all our attacks. 
We pursued it without relaxation for an hour, and I began to think it would prove difficult to capture when the animal, possessed with the perverse idea of vengeance of which he had cause to repent, turned upon the pinace and assailed us in its turn. This manoeuvre did not escape the Canadian. "'Look out!' he cried. The coxswain said some words in his outlandish tongue, doubtless warning the men to keep on their guard. The dugong came within twenty feet of the boat, stopped, sniffed the air briskly with its large nostrils, not pierced at the extremity but in the upper part of its muzzle, then, taking a spring, he threw himself upon us. The pinace could not avoid the shock, and, half upset, shipped at least two tons of water which had to be emptied, but, thanks to the coxswain, we caught it sideways, not full front, so we were not quite overturned. While Ned Land, clinging to the bows, belaboured the gigantic animal with blows from his harpoon, the creature's teeth were buried in the gunwale, and it lifted the whole thing out of the water as a lion does a roebuck. We were upset over one another, and I know not how that adventure would have ended if the Canadian, still enraged with the beast, had not struck it to the heart. I heard its teeth grind on the iron plate, and the dugong disappeared, carrying the harpoon with him. But the barrel soon returned to the surface, and shortly after the body of the animal turned on its back. The boat came up with it, took it in tow, and made straight for the Nautilus. It required tackle of enormous strength to hoist the dugong onto the platform. It weighed ten thousand pounds. The next day, the 11th of February, the larder of the Nautilus was enriched by some more delicate game. A flight of sea swallows rested on the Nautilus, it was a species peculiar to Egypt. Its beak is black, head grey and pointed, the eye surrounded by white spots, the back, wings and tail of a greyish colour, the belly and throat white and claws red. They also took some dozen of Nile ducks, a wild bird of high flavour, its throat and upper part of its head white with black spots. About five o'clock in the evening, we sighted to the north the Cape of Ras Mohammed. This cape forms the extremity of Arabia Petraea, comprised between the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The Nautilus penetrated into the Straits of Jubal, which leads to the Gulf of Suez. I distinctly saw high mountains towering between two gulfs of Ras Mohammed. It was Mount Horeb, that Sinai at the top of which Moses saw God face to face. At six o'clock, the Nautilus, sometimes floating, sometimes immersed, passed some distance from Tor, situated at the end of the bay, the waters of which seemed tinted with red, an observation already made by Captain Nemo. Then night fell in the midst of a heavy silence, sometimes broken by the cries of the pelican and other night birds, and the noise of the waves breaking upon the shore, chafing against the rocks, or the panting of some far-off steamer beating the waters of the gulf with its noisy paddles. From eight to nine o'clock, the Nautilus remained some fathoms under the water. According to my calculation, we must have been very near Suez. Through the panel of the saloon, I saw the bottom of the rocks brilliantly lit up by our electric lamp. We seemed to be leaving the straits behind us more and more. At a quarter past nine, the vessel having returned to the surface, I mounted the platform. Most impatient to pass through Captain Nemo's tunnel, I could not stay in one place, so came to breathe the fresh night air. Soon, in the shadow, I saw a pale light, half discoloured by the fog, shining about a mile from us. "'A floating lighthouse,' said someone near me. I turned and saw the captain. "'It is the floating light of Suez,' he continued, "'and it will not be long before we gain the entrance of the tunnel.' "'The entrance cannot be easy.' "'No, sir. For that reason I am accustomed to go into the steerman's cage and myself direct our course. And now, if you will go down, Monsieur Aronnax, the Nautilus is going under the waves and will not return to the surface until we have passed through the Arabian Tunnel.' Captain Nemo led me towards the central staircase. Halfway down he opened a door, traversed the upper deck and landed in the pilot's cage, which, it may be remembered, is at the extremity of the platform. It was a cabin measuring six feet square, very much like that occupied by the pilot of the steamboats of the Mississippi or Hudson. In the midst worked a wheel, placed vertical and caught at the tiller trope, which ran to the back of the Nautilus. Four light ports with lenticular glasses, let in a groove to the partition of the cabin, allowed the man at the wheel to see in all directions. The cabin was dark, but soon my eyes accustomed themselves to the obscurity, and I perceived the pilot, a strong man, with his hands resting on the spokes of the wheel. 
Outside, the sea appeared vividly lit up by the lantern, which shed its rays from the back of the cabin to the other extremity of the platform. Now, said Captain Nemo, let us try to make our passage. Electric wires connected the pilot's cage with the machinery room, and from there the captain could communicate simultaneously to his Nautilus the direction and the speed. He pressed a metal knob, and at once the speed of the screw diminished. I looked in silence at the high straight wall we were running by at this moment, the immovable base of a massive sandy coast. We followed it thus for an hour only some few yards off. Captain Nemo did not take his eye from the knob, suspended by its two concentric circles in the cabin. At a simple gesture, the pilot modified the course of the Nautilus every instant. I had placed myself at the port scuttle and saw some magnificent substructures of coral, zoophyte, seaweed and fucus, agitating their enormous claws which stretched out from the fissures of the rock. At a quarter past ten, the captain himself took the helm. A large gallery, black and deep, opened before us. The Nautilus went boldly into it. A strange roaring was heard around its sides. It was the waters of the Red Sea, which the incline of the tunnel precipitated violently towards the Mediterranean. The Nautilus went with the current, rapid as an arrow, in spite of the efforts of the machinery, which, in order to offer more effective resistance, beat the waves with reversed screw. On the walls of the narrow passage I could see nothing but brilliant rays, straight lines, furrows of fire, traced by the great speed under the brilliant electric light. My heart beat fast. At thirty-five minutes past ten, Captain Nemo quitted the helm, and turning to me said, The Mediterranean. In less than twenty minutes the Nautilus, carried along by the torrent, had passed through the Isthmus of Suez. Chapter 6. The Grecian Archipelago The next day, the 12th of February, at the dawn of day, the Nautilus rose to the surface. I hastened onto the platform. Three miles to the south, the dim outline of Pelusium was to be seen. A torrent had carried us from one sea to another. About seven o'clock, Ned and Conseil joined me. "'Well, Sir Naturalist,' said the Canadian in a slightly jovial tone, "'and the Mediterranean?' "'We are floating on its surface, friend Ned.' "'What?' said Conseil. "'This very night?' "'Yes, this very night. "'In a few minutes we have passed this impassable isthmus.' "'I do not believe it,' replied the Canadian. "'Then you are wrong, Master Land,' I continued. "'This low coast which rounds off to the south is the Egyptian coast, "'and you who have such good eyes, Ned, "'you can see the jetty of Port Said stretching into the sea.' Canadian looked attentively. "'Certainly you are right, sir, and your captain is a first-rate man. We are in the Mediterranean. Good. Now, if you please, let us talk of our own little affair, but so that no one hears us.' I saw what the Canadian wanted, and in any case I thought it better to let him talk, as he wished it, so we all three went and sat down near the lantern where we were less exposed to the sprays of the blades.' "'Now, Ned, we listen. What have you to tell us?' "'What I have to tell you is very simple. We are in Europe, and before Captain Nemo's caprices drag us once more to the bottom of the polar seas or lead us into Oceania, I ask to leave the Nautilus.' I wished in no way to shackle the liberty of my companions, but I certainly felt no desire to leave Captain Nemo, and thanks to his apparatus, I was each day nearer the completion of my submarine studies, and I was rewriting my book of submarine depths in its very element. Should I ever again have such an opportunity of observing the wonders of the ocean? No, certainly not, and I could not bring myself to the idea of abandoning the Nautilus before the cycle of investigation was accomplished. Friend Ned, let me answer you frankly. Are you tired of being on board? "'And sorry that destiny has thrown us into Captain Nemo's hands?' The Canadian remained some moments without answering. Then, crossing his arms, he said, "'Frankly, I do not regret this journey under the seas. I shall be glad to have made it. But now that it is made, let us have done with it. That is my idea.' "'It will come to an end, Ned.' "'Where and when?' Where, I do not know. When, I cannot say. Or rather, I suppose it will end when these seas have nothing more to teach us. Then what do you hope for? demanded the Canadian. 
that circumstances may occur as well six months hence as now, by which we may and ought to profit. Oh, said Ned Land, and where shall we be in six months, if you please, Sir Naturalist? Perhaps in China? You know the Nautilus is a rapid traveller. It goes through water as swallows through the air, or as an express of the land. It does not fear frequented seas. Who can say that it may not beat the coasts of France, England, or America, on which flight may be attempted as advantageously as here? Monsieur Aronnax, replied the Canadian, your arguments are rotten to the foundation. You speak in the future. We shall be there. We shall be here. I speak in the present. We are here, and we must profit by it. Ned Land's logic pressed me hard, and I found myself beaten on that ground. I knew not what argument would now tell in my favour. Sir, continued Ned, let us suppose an impossibility. If Captain Nemo should this day offer you your liberty, would you accept it? I do not know, I answered. And if, he added, the offer made you this day was never to be renewed, would you accept it? Uh, friend Ned, this is my answer. Your reasoning is against me. We must not rely on Captain Nemo's good will. Common prudence forbids him to set us at liberty. On the other side, prudence bids us profit by the first opportunity to leave the Nautilus. Well, Monsieur Aronnax, that is wisely said. Only one observation, just one. The occasion must be serious, and our first attempt must succeed. If it fails, we shall never find another, and Captain Nemo will never forgive us. All well, that is true, replied the Canadian, but your observation applies equally to all attempts at flight, whether in two years' time or in two days. But the question is still this. If a favourable opportunity presents itself, it must be seized. Agreed. And now, Ned, will you tell me what you mean by a favourable opportunity? It will be that which, on a dark night, will bring the Nautilus a short distance from some European coast. And you will try and save yourself by swimming? Yes, if we were near enough to the bank, and if the vessel was floating at the time, not if the bank was far away and the boat was under the water. And in that case... In that case, I should seek to make myself master of the Panace. I know how it has worked. We must get inside, and the bolts once drawn, we shall come across the surface of the water, without even the pilot who is in the bows perceiving our flight. Well, Ned, watch for the opportunity, but do not forget that a hitch will ruin us. I will not forget, sir. And now, Ned, would you like to know what I think of your project? Certainly, Monsieur Aronnax. Well, I think, I do not say I hope, I think that this favourable opportunity will never present itself. Why not? Because Captain Nemo cannot hide from himself that we have not given up all hope of regaining our liberty, and he will be on his guard, above all, in the seas and in the sight of European coasts. We shall see, replied Ned Land, shaking his head determinedly. And now, Ned Land, I added, let us stop here. Not another word on the subject. The day that you are ready, come and let us know, and we will follow you. I rely entirely upon you. Thus ended a conversation which, at no very distant time, led to such grave results. I must say here that facts seem to confirm my foresight to the Canadian's great despair. Did Captain Nemo distrust us in these frequented waters? Or did he only wish to hide himself from the numerous vessels of all nations which ploughed the Mediterranean? I could not tell, but we were oftener between waters and far from coast, or if the Nautilus did emerge, nothing was to be seen but the pilot's cage, and sometimes it went to great depths, far between the Grecian archipelago and Asia Minor. We could not touch the bottom by more than a thousand fathoms. Thus I only knew we were near the island of Carpathos, by Captain Nemo reciting some lines from Virgil, as he pointed to a spot in the planisphere. It was indeed the ancient abode of Proteus, the old shepherd of Neptune's flocks, now the island of Scarpanto, situated between Rhodes and Crete. I saw nothing but the granite base through the glass panels of the saloon. The next day, the 14th of February, I resolved to employ some hours in studying the fishes of the archipelago. 
but for some reason or other the panels remained hermetically sealed. Upon taking the course of the Nautilus, I found that we were going towards Candia, the ancient Isle of Crete. At the time I embarked upon the Abraham Lincoln, the whole of this island had risen in insurrection against the Turks, but how the insurgents had fared since that time I was absolutely ignorant, and it was not Captain Nemo, deprived of all land communications, who could tell me. I made no allusion to this event when that night I found myself alone with him in the saloon. Besides, he seemed to be taciturn and preoccupied. Then, contrary to his custom, he ordered both panels to be opened, and going from one side to the other, observed the mass of waters attentively. To what end, I could not guess, so on my side I employed my time in studying the fish passing before my eyes. In the midst of the waters, a man appeared, a diver carrying at his belt a leathern purse. It was not a body abandoned to the waves, it was a living man, swimming with a strong hand, disappearing occasionally to take breath at the surface. I turned towards Captain Nemo, and in an agitated voice exclaimed, A man shipwrecked! He must be saved at any price! The captain did not answer me, but came and leaned against the panel. The man had approached, and with his face flattened against the glass, was looking at us. To my great amazement, Captain Nemo signed to him. The diver answered with his hand, mounted immediately to the surface of the water, and did not appear again. "'Do not be uncomfortable,' said Captain Nemo. "'It is Nicholas of Cape Matapan, surnamed Pesca. He is well known in all these islands. A bold diver. Water is his element, and he lives more in it than on land, going continually from one island to another, even as far as Crete. "'You know him, Captain?' Why not, Monsieur Aronnax? Saying which, Captain Nemo went towards a piece of furniture standing near the left panel of the saloon. Near this piece of furniture I saw a chest bound with iron, on the cover of which was a copper plate, bearing the cipher of the Nautilus with its device. At that moment the captain, without noticing my presence, opened the piece of furniture, a sort of strong box which held a great many ingots. They were ingots of gold. From whence came this precious metal, which represented an enormous sum? Where did the captain gather this gold from? And what was he going to do with it? I did not say one word. I looked. Captain Nemo took the ingots one by one and arranged them methodically in the chest, which he filled entirely. I estimated the contents at more than four thousand pounds worth of gold, that is to say nearly two hundred thousand pounds. The chest was securely fastened, and the captain wrote an address on the lid, in characters which must have belonged to modern Greece. This done, Captain Nemo pressed a knob, the wire of which communicated with the quarters of the crew. Four men appeared, and not without some trouble pushed the chest out of the saloon. Then I heard them hoisting it up the iron staircase by means of pulleys. At that moment Captain Nemo turned to me. "'And you were saying, sir,' said he, "'I was saying nothing, Captain.' Then, sir, if you will allow me, I will wish you good night. Whereupon he turned and left the saloon. I returned to my room much troubled, as one may believe. I vainly tried to sleep. I sought the connecting link between the apparition of the diver and the chest filled with gold. Soon I felt by certain movements of pitching and tossing that the Nautilus was leaving the depths and returning to the surface. Then I heard steps upon the platform, and I knew they were unfastening the pinnace and launching it upon the waters. For one instant it struck the side of the Nautilus. Then all noise ceased. Two hours after, the same noise, the same going and coming, was renewed. The boat was hoisted on board, replaced in its socket, and the Nautilus again plunged under the waves. So these millions had been transported to their address. To what point on the continent? Who was Captain Nemo's correspondent? The next day I related to Conseil and the Canadian the events of the night, which had excited my curiosity to the highest degree. My companions were not less surprised than myself. But where does he take his millions to? asked Ned Land. To that there was no possible answer. I returned to the saloon after having breakfast and set to work. Till five o'clock in the evening I employed myself in arranging my notes. At that moment... Ought I to attribute it to some peculiar idiosyncrasy? I felt so great a heat that I was obliged to take off my coat. It was strange, for we were under low latitudes, and even then the Nautilus, submerged as it was, ought to experience no change of temperature. I looked at the manometer. It showed a depth of sixty feet, to which atmospheric heat could never attain. 
I continued my work, but the temperature rose to such a pitch as to be intolerable. Could there be a fire on board? I asked myself. I was leaving the saloon when Captain Nemo entered. He approached the thermometer, consulted it, and turned to me, saying, Forty-two degrees. I have noticed it, Captain, I replied, and if it gets much hotter, we cannot bear it. Oh, sir, it will not get hotter if we do not wish it. You can reduce it as you please, then. No, but I can go further from the stove which produces it. It is outward, then. Certainly. We are floating in a current of boiling water. Is it possible? I exclaimed. Look. The panels opened, and I saw the sea entirely white all around. A sulphurous smoke was curling amid the waves, which boiled like water in a copper. I placed my hand on one of the panes of glass, but the heat was so great that I quickly took it off again. "'Where are we?' I asked. "'Near the island of Santorin, sir,' replied the captain. "'I wish to give you the sight of the curious spectacle of a submarine eruption.' "'I thought,' said I, "'that the formation of these new islands was ended.' "'Nothing is ever ended in the volcanic parts of the sea,' replied Captain Nemo, "'and the globe is always being worked by subterranean fires. "'Already in the nineteenth year of our era, "'according to Cassiodorus and Pliny, a new island. "'Thea, the divine, appeared in the very place "'where these islets have been recently formed. "'Then they sank under the waves to rise again in the year 69, "'when they again subsided. "'Since that time, to our days, the Plutonian work has been suspended.' But on the 3rd of February, 1866, a new island, which they named George Island, emerged from the midst of the sulphurous vapour and settled again on the 6th of the same month. Seven days after, the 13th of February, the island of Afrisa appeared. I was in these seas when the phenomenon occurred, and I was able, therefore, to observe all the different phases. The island of Afrisa, of round form, measured 300 feet in diameter and 30 feet in height. It was composed of black and vitreous lava, mixed with fragments of felspar. And lastly, on the 10th of March, a smaller island called Reka showed itself, and since then these three have been joined together, forming but one and the same island. "'And the canal in which we are in at this moment?' I asked." "'Here it is,' replied Captain Nemo, showing me a map of the archipelago. "'You see, I have marked the new islands.' I returned to the glass. The Nautilus was no longer moving. The heat was becoming unbearable. The sea, which till now had been white, was red, owing to the presence of salts of iron. In spite of the ships being hermetically sealed, an insupportable smell of sulphur filled the saloon, and the brilliancy of the electricity was entirely extinguished by bright scarlet flames.' I was in a bath, I was choking, I was broiled. We can remain no longer in this boiling water, said I to the captain. It would not be prudent, replied the impassive Captain Nemo. An order was given. The Nautilus tacked about and left the furnace it could not brave with impunity. A quarter of an hour after, we were breathing fresh air on the surface. The thought then struck me that if Ned Land had chosen this part of the sea for our flight, we should never have come alive out of this sea of fire. The next day, the 16th of February, we left the basin which, between Rhodes and Alexandria, is reckoned about 1,500 fathoms in depth, and the Nautilus, passing some distance from Corrigo, quitted the Grecian archipelago after having doubled Cape Matapan. Chapter 7. The Mediterranean in 48 Hours the Mediterranean, the blue sea par excellence, the great sea of the Hebrews, the sea of the Greeks, the mare nostrum of the Romans, bordered by orange trees, aloes, cacti and sea pines, embalmed with the perfume of the myrtle, surrounded by rude mountains, saturated with pure and transparent air, but incessantly worked by underground fires, a perfect battlefield in which Neptune and Pluto still dispute the empire of the world. It is upon these banks and on these waters, says Michelet, that man is renewed in one of the most powerful climates of the globe. But, beautiful as it was, I could only take a rapid glance at the basin whose superficial area is two million of square miles. Even Captain Nemo's knowledge was lost to me, for this puzzling person did not appear once during our passage at full speed. I estimated the course which the Nautilus took under the waves of the sea at about 600 leagues, 
and it was accomplished in 48 hours. Starting on the morning of the 16th of February from the shores of Greece, we had crossed the Straits of Gibraltar by sunrise on the 18th. It was plain to me that this Mediterranean, enclosed in the midst of those countries which he wished to avoid, was distasteful to Captain Nemo. Those waves and those breezes brought back too many remembrances, if not too many regrets. Here he had no longer that independence and that liberty of gait which he had when in the open seas, and his Nautilus felt itself cramped between the close shores of Africa and Europe. Our speed was now 25 miles an hour. It may be well understood that Ned Land, to his great disgust, was obliged to renounce his intended flight. He could not launch the pinace going at the rate of 12 or 13 yards every second. To quit the Nautilus under such conditions would be as bad as jumping from a train going at full speed. An imprudent thing, to say the least of it. Besides, our vessel only mounted to the surface of the waves at night to renew its stock of air. It was steered entirely by the compass and the log. I saw no more of the interior of this Mediterranean than a traveller by express train perceives of the landscape which flies before his eyes, that is to say, the distant horizon, and not the nearer objects which pass like a flash of lightning. We were then passing between Sicily and the coast of Tunis. In the narrow space between Cape Bon and the Straits of Messina, the bottom of the sea rose almost suddenly. There was a perfect bank on which there was not more than nine fathoms of water, whilst on either side the depth was ninety fathoms. The Nautilus had to manoeuvre very carefully so as not to strike against this submarine barrier. I showed Conseil on the map of the Mediterranean the spot occupied by this reef. But if you please, sir, observed Conseil, it is like a real isthmus joining Europe to Africa. Yes, my boy. It forms a perfect bar to the Straits of Libya, and the soundings of Smith have proved that in former times the continents between Cape Boko and Cape Farina were joined. I can well believe it, said Conseil. I will add, I continued, that a similar barrier exists between Gibraltar and Ceuta, which in geological times formed the entire Mediterranean. What if some volcanic burst should one day raise these two barriers above the waves? It is not probable, Conseil. Well, but allow me to finish, sir. If this phenomenon should take place, it will be troublesome for Monsieur Lesseps, who has taken on much pains to pierce this isthmus. I agree with you, but I repeat, Conseil, this phenomenon will never happen. The violence of subterranean force is ever diminishing. Volcanoes, so plentiful in the first days of the world, are being extinguished by degrees. The internal heat is weakened. The temperature of the lower strata of the globe is lowered by a perceptible quantity every century, to the detriment of our globe, for its heat is its life. But the sun? The sun is not sufficient, Conseil. Can it give heat to a dead body? Not that I know of. Well, my friend, this earth will one day be that cold corpse. It will become uninhabitable and uninhabited like the moon, which has long since lost all its vital heat. In how many centuries? In some hundreds of thousands of years, my boy. Then, said Conseil, we shall have time to finish our journey. That is, if Ned Land does not interfere with it. And Conseil, reassured, returned to the study of the bank, which the Nautilus was skirting at a moderate speed. On the 18th of February, about three o'clock in the morning, we were at the entrance of the Straits of Gibraltar. There once existed two currents, an upper one, long since recognised, which conveys the waters of the ocean into the basin of the Mediterranean, and a lower countercurrent, which reasoning has now shown to exist. Indeed, the volume of water in the Mediterranean, incessantly added to by the waves of the Atlantic and by rivers falling into it, would each year raise the level of this sea, for its evaporation is not sufficient to restore its equilibrium. As it is not so, we must necessarily admit the existence of an undercurrent, which empties into the basin of the Atlantic through the Straits of Gibraltar, the surplus waters of the Mediterranean. A fact indeed, and it was this countercurrent by which the Nautilus profited. It advanced rapidly by the narrow pass. For one instant I caught a glimpse of the beautiful ruins of the Temple of Hercules, buried in the ground, according to Pliny, and with a low island which supports it. And a few minutes later, we were floating on the Atlantic. Uh, 
and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part 8 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. If you did enjoy it, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next time with part 9 of the story, the penultimate episode. I hope you can join me.